Good afternoon. For those who don't know me, my name is Cindy Seaton Rogers, and I am the Academic and Outreach Events Manager at the Ackerman Center for Holocaust Studies here at UT Dallas. I would like to welcome all of you able to join us for today. Um, before we jump into this presentation, I do want to go over just a couple of quick items. First of all, please make sure that you are muted and that you stay muted throughout the event. There will be a question and answer session at the end, so please go ahead and put any of your questions or comments into the chat, and we will address as many as we can. Um, I will now turn you over to Dr. Niels Romer, who will introduce our speaker tonight. In addition to being the interim dean for the School of Arts and Humanities and the School of Arts, Technology, and Emerging Communication, Dr. Romer is the Stan and Barbara Rabin Distinguished Professor in Holocaust Studies and the director of the Ackerman Center. Dr. Romer? Hi, good afternoon or, or good evening, wherever you are. Um, we're just actually at this curious moment where we have begun again to have in-person events. Um, always with already masks at hand when needed. But at the same time, we've learned over the last, whatever, 18 months also the benefits of Zoom events that allow us actually to connect in a more global manner with people who have uh, share our interests and our mission. And so we're really thrilled to kind of carry forward also the things that we've learned during the pandemic. And uh, Zooming is apparently one of them. So thrilled to have you all here once again. Um, let me just quickly introduce our distinguished speaker, and then we um, will be off to a good start. So our wonderful guest today is Grania de Borca, who is the Florence Allenwood Allen Professor of Law at NYU and Director of the Hauser Global Law Program. Before joining NYU in 2011, she held tenure posts at, as a professor of Harvard Law School, Fordham Law School, and the European University Institute in Florence, Italy. Lots of really distinguished places, also nice places on, on various maps, um, all very desirable. But before all of that, she was actually a fellow at the Somerville College and Lecture in Law at Oxford University. And the reason why she's here with us, it's not just that she's a widely traveled scholar, as you can see by her uh, biography, but her main fields of research are on European law and international law and human rights, something that obviously has become of growing interest to us. And she is a co-editor of the Oxford University Press Series, Oxford Studies in European Law and co-author of the leading um, o, um, Oxford University Press textbook on EU law. She also is a co-editor in chief, she must be really busy, of the International <laughs> Journal of Constitutional Law, ICON, and a member of the Board of Editors, the American Journal of International Law and a corresponding fellow of the British Academy. So now we're even more pleased that you're here, that you found time. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation to speak about, um, about my work. This is, the talk will be based on a recent book I wrote um, about international uh, human rights law. Um, I, I, it's true, uh, as you introduced me, that a lot of my work in the past was uh, on European Union law, but in recent years I've also uh, taught and researched and written a bit more in the field of uh, human rights. Um, and actually I've mostly been busy during the pandemic cooking for my children while they were being homeschooled, but uh, it's great to be able to turn back, as you said, in, as we emerge from the pandemic back into uh, more normal academic activities. Um, so what, what I'd like to, to talk about is maybe to just give you a sense of um, the main themes of the book that I wrote recently, because um, the, the title of the book is Human Rights in a Turbulent Era. And what drew me to write it really was um, the fact that we're living in an era, as I, I guess most of you probably experience in the same way that feels unusually or, or uh, maybe not um, uniquely, but a, a highly turbulent one. Um, there are geopolitical changes, uh, ge geological and climate changes, um, all kinds of uh, changes taking place um, politically and in other ways. And at the time that uh, there's a great sense of instability and flux and turbulence and so on, um, we're also seeing something of um, a backlash against uh, human rights. And the book is written as a response to two kinds of debates. Um, and the first one is a debate recently that's arisen 
amongst intellectuals um, about um, what, what is called, or what's been rather graphically kind of called, I think, the end times of human rights. So we see in recent years a, a series of, of prominent critics, of really prominent intellectuals, writing about the fact that the end times are here for the human rights movement. That's the name of one of the books by Stephen Hopgood, The End Times of Human Rights, but there are others. Um, uh, another very prominent uh, author, Samuel Moyne, wrote about human rights uh, being not enough. That's the title of the book, not enough, um, about their complicity in all kinds of um, social ills. And uh, another is entitled The Twilight of Human Rights um, by Eric Posner. So you, you see the common theme here that, um, that the time, the, the high point such as it was of human rights is over. And they're saying this not just as a sort of a factual description, but also it has a normative dimension. They're arguing that it should be. These are highly critical accounts of human rights and the human rights movement saying this, this um, movement, the law, the practice, human rights advocacy and so on has had its day and should be something else is needed, something better. Um, so the, the book, the motivation for it was partly to respond to some of these and to kind of push back against the account of human rights they were giving um, and, and its weaknesses and failures and so on. Um, it was also secondly a, an account, uh, sorry, a response to a debate, not so much about is it the end times or not, but a, a more particular kind of scholarly debate amongst political scientists mainly about how is human rights law effective at all? And, and if so, how? You know, we have these human rights treaties, but they're just these high level laws and international law in particular, we tend not to think of as very effective. Um, so how is it, if at all, that human rights um, enshrined in human rights law become effective? So um, I wanted to intervene in that debate too. So to start with the sort of end times, hard times, um, it does seem to be the case that even if it's not the end times for human rights, these certainly are very hard times. So I'll, I'll just list some of the developments that are really challenging um, human rights law, human rights lawyers, um, human rights activists and advocates. Um, first of all, as we know, populist illiberalism has been rising around the world. You know, here in the US, in Brazil, in India, in the Philippines, in Hungary, in Poland, within democracies in, you know, parts of the, not just the US, but in, in many other parts of um, the world, formerly stable democracies are beginning to, cracks are beginning to show there's an increasing rise of the far right um, and, and the sort of uh, centrist and mainstream parties are taking on board um, many of the, the policies and, and the rhetoric of the far right. So this sort of rise of a liberalism um, is cha profoundly challenging, I think, um, human rights, uh, the practice and um, law of human rights. Um, secondly, and apart from the rise of populist liberalism, authoritarian states, um, existing authoritarian states, non-democracies are growing in stature in their economic and political power and challenging the idea of you know, democracy and um, uh, liberal democracy in particular as the most desirable or effective form of governing. Um, the quality of democracy is weakening in established democracies, even as authoritarian states are growing. We see a huge dissatisfaction within established democracies, political polarization, um, and a kind of a, according to some studies, a kind of an indifference on the part of many young people to um, democracy as a form of government. Um, we also see renewed nationalism. Um, Brexit in, in Europe is just one example, but renewed nationalism in many parts of the world, including um, resistance to international law and institutions, withdrawal from various human rights treaties or for the International Criminal Court, um, and the, the sort of um, spread of alternative international movements, um, one that the United States signed on to under the previous administration, the Trump administration, was the Con Geneva Consensus Declaration, it was called, which is a highly conservative, um, kind of illiberal so-called rights declaration focusing on um, the rights and authority of the family and pushing back against gender equality and other kinds of um, LGBTQ plus rights. So we see not just resistance to existing human rights, but the creation of new kind of illiberal um, rights declarations. And finally, um, we see you know, the pandemic has 
served uh, in a way as a justification for emergency measures being introduced, derogations from human rights and all kinds of you know, shrinkages of um, the space for um, human rights and human rights law. So even as these, um, these are the, the sort of political, the growing political challenges to, to human rights around the world, we also see what I began with, these, these scholarly and intellectual critiques of rights as well. So you might think, oh, well, in the face of these kind of political challenges, we'll have, you know, the scholars defending and standing up for human rights. But on the contrary, both the left and the right of the political, of the intellectual spectrum, um, we've had an array of prominent scholars being very critical of human rights. So um, in, in the argument of some human rights claim to be universal, but really are a kind of a hegemonic global north imposition. Um, a culturally interventionist and insensitive imposition um, uh, from the West or the North uh, onto the rest of the world, um, masquerading as a, as a universal project. For others, you know, the, the, the flaws or the problems of human rights are that it's, it's such an elite managerial top-down kind of project. You know, the Geneva bureaucrats are managing um, the world through this kind of uh, array of human rights treaties. Um, for others, they see it as promoting neoliberal capitalism. You know, it's against redistribution. It's, it's a kind of a, um, a mask for a, really a, a capitalist agenda. Um, others think it, it crowds out, uh, displaces radical projects. It's kind of weak, it's ineffectual. So human rights as kind of an inadequate um, uh, project for addressing uh, injustices of various kinds. Um, and then there's the sort of, more, these are very strong kind of claims and then other claims are, well, they don't make enough difference. So there's no evidence that they make enough difference. So all these human rights laws and institutions and practices aren't really changing things. Um, so those are the two sets of challenges. I think, you know, these major political um, developments that, that challenge um, human rights and then sort of lack of intellectual support. And in, in fact, a lot of intellectual skepticism about rights. And so against that, um, one of the things that the book suggests is that there's something not necessarily paradoxical, but interesting that in the face of all these political challenges and intellectual challenges, actually um, mobilization around human rights is, is spreading. So there, there's a sense in which despite the, you know, geopolitical events and despite the intellectual stances of many scholars of the subject, um, what we see is, is you know, movements all over the world, um, more than ever, I think, in recent years, invoking the language, the discourse, the, the laws, the instruments, the institutions of human rights to push for projects of social justice, different kinds. And so just to give some examples, even here in the US, the Black Lives Matter movement is described by its co-founder as a human rights movement, um, deliberately choosing that sort of description, not just a civil rights movement, but a human rights movement integrating socioeconomic rights and civil and political rights. Um, we also see climate um, rights uh, being invoked everywhere. The, the climate movement and the climate marches um, use the language institutions and tools of human rights. There's an enormous amount of climate litigation taking place at present before human rights courts, including one by um, Greta Thunberg and a group of children to the Committee on the Rights of the Child, but also before multiple uh, human rights courts and institutions and domestic courts as well. So the framework and language and ideas of human rights are being used um, in, in the context of climate. Um, there are many, many civil and political rights protests in across all continents of the world, you know, Thailand, uh, Hong Kong, Belarus, Nigeria, Russia, Myanmar, and so on. Um, in recent years, I could mention many others. Um, and uh, these are taking place, you know, um, in, in many different jurisdictions, um, alongside economic justice protests in many others in Chile, Ecuador, Tunisia, Lebanon, Jordan, and so on. Um, many of them using the language of rights um, as part of their protest. And we also see, and some of these are, are described in the book, reproductive rights marches. Um, I, some of the studies um, I undertook for the book included reproductive rights uh, mobilization in Ireland, in Pakistan, and in Argentina, 
um, and we've seen it recently also in Poland, probably soon to be here in the US also, um, and more generally women's rights marches. And these have really uh, expanded and spread in many parts of the world in Spain, the US, Italy, Taiwan, Pakistan and others. So, you know, the picture is not as simple. In other words, these are really challenging times for human rights, but they're also times of hope. Um, and that's one of the arguments of the book. It's, it's trying to, um, to push back in a way against some of the pessimism, some of the um, excess of the critiques. I think there's much in the criticisms that's very helpful and good for reforming and renewing and adapting human rights strategies and tools and so on. But there's also much in it that's really exaggerated and the, the deep pessimism, I think, is not matched by the energy that we see worldwide in um, uh, civil society and social movements. So th what the book does is it sort of presents what I call an experimentalist account um, of the effectiveness of human rights that's building in part on some existing theories but challenging others. And it builds this theory by drawing on three main case studies, one of gender justice in Pakistan, one on disability rights in Argentina, and one on uh, reproductive rights as well as children's rights in Ireland. And what it tries to do, it doesn't try to respond to all of the critiques I've, I've expressed, but some of them, and in particular, that human rights and human rights law are ineffective, that they don't uh, contribute to bringing about uh, positive social change. Um, the second is that, you know, I'm trying to push back against the argument that human rights is an elite bureaucratic top-down project that displaces politics. Um, and the third is the idea that, you know, human rights is a kind of uh, the, the hegemonic imposition from outside or from above somehow of an external framework and norm uh, and human rights norms. And, and instead I'm arguing that, you know, the human rights movement is a very broad pluralist dynamic and vibrant one. And that at this particular crucial era in this particular crucial time um, where you know human rights are under stress um, that that we should be aiming to renew and reform the movement rather than as some of the critics claim to abandon it and to resort to politics seems to be the the alternative in their view and, and my argument is that human rights law and human rights mobilization is political it's it's just a particular um, set of techniques and tools and so on um, underpinned by certain ideals um, and norms on which a certain consensus has been built um, and that it's not uh, apolitical or an alternative to politics. Okay, so um, just to move on a little bit and say something about the, um, the, the more scholarly argument of the book, um, as opposed to that broader kind of political argument that there is a, a body of human rights uh, scholarship, mostly not so much by lawyers because lawyers tend to assume human rights law is effective Obviously, political scientists and social scientists don't. They study it and say, well, is it? And if so, how? Um, and, you know, there was a, over the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a huge number of studies done to try to see, well, actually, is, there, are, is human rights law at all effective? What happens when the human rights treaty is signed and ratified by a state? And the first sort of array of these studies said, well, there's really no improvement. So, um, a range of political scientists, Keith, Hathaway, Hafner, Burton, Tutsui, did these large empirical studies and said, well, we can't show any improvement in human rights standards, conditions domestically after human rights treaty ratification. But then there was a second wave of these studies and maybe the gold standard of them is, is by Beth Simmons, who's a, a political scientist at uh, UPenn. And the second wave sort of challenged the methodologies of the first and said, well, wait a minute, you're taking these very broad brush studies and they looked into the conditions and various other kinds of criteria being used in the studies. And by challenging them, they came up with more nuanced studies saying that there is actually, and we can show a positive correlation between human rights treaty ratification, that's you know new human rights laws um, and improved human rights standards where, and this was the crucial condition, where there's domestic civil society presence. So that seemed to be the crucial thing, um, that actually human rights treaties can make a difference in practice in countries in which you have some space for domestic civil society. So that's where my book kind of fits in. I, I wanted to take that insight, that finding of these studies and to figure out, well, how, what is it about domestic civil society that um, makes international human rights treaties uh, effective or helps them to become effective. And there were some existing theories that suggested, so Catherine Sicking had a very famous boomerang idea that you know, human rights are like a boomerang. 
the domestic activists can't get anywhere domestically. They're caught in these regimes that don't recognize their rights and they've repressed their rights. So they call out to external actors, you know, to powerful states, to powerful international institutions. Um, and the boomerang comes back in the shape of pressure from those external actors. And that pressure from external actors forces governments to change. So that was her account. Then Beth Simmons had a different view. You know, she said, well, no, it's actually, it's domestic mobilization in itself. So civil society actors, you know, the things they do by marching, by lobbying, by litigating and so on, they, they change, they bring about change. And the role of the international treaty for her was kind of a signaling one. It's just like that gives a sort of a signal. So what, where my book comes in and tries to say, well, actually it's a bit more than either of these two. Um, that, you know, I, I took these three studies and also looked at some other uh, examples of the way human rights treaties were used by uh, domestic um, actors, by human rights activists and advocates and social movements. And the book suggests that what matters is actually ongoing interaction and engagement between domestic actors and international actors. That it's a back and forth, an iterative ongoing process, not just a domestic mobilization, we give you know, effect to the treaty or somehow these external actors imposing pressure. It's actually a very complex, ongoing, multi-stage uh, and, and uh, multi-actor kind of process. Um, and it's slow in many cases, it's not rapid and very few important, really fundamental changes come about through one-shot actions. That's what I, I discovered through like a famous court case or a big campaign. These are ongoing and they really seem to rely on the different inputs of a range of different types of actors. So the three, you know, the, the argument, the experimentalist account I'm suggesting, you know, argues that human rights are advanced in practice through long-term dynamic iterative engagement, often contentious engagement, between three main groups of domestically situated and internationally situated actors, networks, norms, and institutions. So the three main groups are first domestic actors, the ones who mobilize to challenge practices, the ones who highlight injustices and claim rights. So these are the affected people and their advocates. So that can be, there's an array of different types of actors here, but it can be communities, NGOs, um, advocates, social movements, and so on. Um, and th so that's the first group. The second group then are transnational and international institutions and networks that provide what I call an external accountability forum. So they're external to the, you know, to the state because very often states, especially if they're more repressive or just have, you know, are ignoring or sidelining or marginalizing some groups or some issues, they're not responsive. So the external uh, forum and these institutions and networks help to um, provide a, a place of accountability. They hear and they facilitate debate of claims and issues. Uh, they facilitate contestation. And in the case of courts or these human rights treaty bodies that, that sort of monitor the various human rights treaties, they help to articulate and develop legal and normative human rights standards in conversation with states and civil society. Um, and so that's the, the second group of actors. And the domestic, you know, the, the affected communities or individuals and their advocates engage with these transnational institutions and networks. Um, and then the third set of actors and, and uh, institutions that I found, I, had, I initially, when I started the book, assumed it was these two. It would just be a back and forth between the complainants, the, you know, the actors mobilizing in these international institutions. But I found that there was another very important third set of, of actors and institutions and that is independent domestic um, institutions and actors like domestic courts, ombudspersons, commissions, the independent media, that these are really important after, you know, the, the sort of going out to the external accountability forum, states still often uh, resist or just sort of stall and do nothing. Um, and domestic independent actors can really help increase leverage, increase pressure, amplify, the arguments and claims of activists and so on, and help to translate or to localize, um, or in, in the words of one scholar, um, to vernacularize 
um, the, the, the normative inputs, the legal inputs from other um, external institutions. So that, that's the argument that, um, you know, the way in which human rights law, human rights treaties help to promote rights respecting social change is through this ongoing iterative interaction between the domestic actors, between the international institutions and networks and um, independent domestic uh, institutions and actors too. And what I hope that, you know, that's, there's a lot of writing about human rights and I hope the, the contribution it makes, I think, is to do a number of different things. One is to try and bring the practice of human rights um, and the work of people on the ground into the frame. So a lot of the critiques I was talking about, the, you know, not enough or hegemonic or bureaucratic, uh, whatever, um, the different types of critiques made of the human rights, um, you know, framework or system, are really thinking about certain elite parts of the system. So they're thinking about the, the bureaucrats in Geneva or um, governments or um, uh, courts. And what I'm trying to do is to, to sort of say, well, what actually brings human rights to life are these um, civil society actors, a whole different array of different kinds of, of actors um, who, you know, whose rights are at stake, you know, the ways they mobilize and claim rights and argue and so on, um, and their, you know, advocates and activists and so on, that we need to bring these into our frame. That's why the book is called Reframing Human Rights. And, and that gives you a different picture and widens the lens a bit from just looking at these elite um, actors and treating them as the sum total of the human rights movement. Um, so it integrates civil society and social mobilization as crucial elements of the human rights system. It also emphasizes, unlike some of these other theories I was describing, multi-level engagement and interaction and the promotion of human rights as a long-term project, you know, that this is not something um, one shot or two shot or, you know, that big structural important change takes time and the, the way in which human rights um, law and advocacy works is over time. Um, and, and so I'm trying to argue for an integrated picture of the international human rights system that's more than the sum of these different parts. I'm also trying to challenge, I mentioned this already, the argument that human rights are just are apolitical, they're legalistic, and they crowd out political responses to injustice. You know, they channel everything into these kind of narrowing frames um, and they, they don't allow for um, political, you know, more wide ranging political responses to injustice. Um, so I, I think that bifurcation between human rights as sort of legalistic and um, politics is somehow more energetic and tumultuous is, is artificial. Um, and also the, the, the last thing I think is, is that I want to question the characterization of human rights as this external imposition, that it comes from the top, that somehow these human rights treaties are imposed on their foreign norms imposed on communities below. That's not at all the picture um, that I saw in, in carrying out the different studies. You know, human rights are claimed by communities. They, it, there's a lot of work they need to do in order to translate their claims and bring them then to these international fora. But more often it is the, the way in which the arguments are made and claimed by the actors themselves and the advocates themselves that changes the views of the international actors and institutions, they're led by, they follow um, uh, the, uh, the advocates and, and um, actors bringing their cases uh, before them. So I'm trying to push back against that idea of human rights as top down um, and uh, externally imposed. And also in a way that lawyers don't like much, even though I'm a lawyer, I'm arguing that human rights law <coughs> is actually a kind of a set of standards and norms that are continually co-created, shaped through the engagement of different sets of international and domestic actors. So they're not out there. If anyone looks at a human rights treaty, they would know that because they're, they're expressed in such broad terms. Um, but there's this idea that somehow the law is there and it's to be imposed and complied with. But actually human rights law, in my view, is, is co-created in this ongoing back and forth between uh, actors and activists. Um, whose, whose rights are at stake and who are claiming rights, and these various institutions that uh, provide an accountability forum that interpret and help to articulate what the rights mean and then 
their implementation in practice by other domestic actors. And then finally, in, in the, towards the end of the book, um, I look at what I call the five major challenges. There are many others, but I pick out five major challenges that we're facing in our current turbulent era. Um, uh, political liberalism, which I began by des describing the rise of a liberalism, which entails, as I said, withdrawing from international institutions, cracking down on civil society, defunding um, civil society activists, and, and worse, you know, um, uh, silencing and disappearing them or uh, criminalizing um, many kinds of, of uh, human rights activism. So political liberalism is a major challenge. Um, climate change is another major challenge um, because it's affecting all kinds of, of rights um, and exacerbating inequalities in all kinds of ways. Digitalization is another one, a really fundamentally transformative um, development that's changing as we are, as we find out right now, we're having this lecture by Zoom. Um, that's just one small example, but digitalization is really changing the way we live, the way we work, um, the way we're governed um, and so on in, in really um, very uh, transformative ways and not all positive transformation. Um, and, and many aspects of that are very challenging uh, for human rights. The surveillance um, capitalism described by uh, Shoshana Zuboff is, puts it all very well, but there are many different dimensions to um, the dark side of digitalization. There's also rising inequality, continually rising inequality, but it seems to um, you know, have, have been really uh, exacerbated in recent decades, um, as Thomas Piketty and others showed. Um, and then there's the pandemic, you know, and each of these major challenges further stresses um, the, the human rights movement and, uh, and the enjoyment of human rights, um, you know, on the part of um, people all over the world. But my argument in the book is that if we, you know, when we think of human rights in this more experimentalist way, you know, not as you know, thinking, oh, it's this court and this pushback against it, but as, you know, a multi-part and very dynamic, very pluralist system, that even when some parts of the system are under pressure, other parts are, um, are energized. And, and I think, you know, looking at the energy in um, social mobilization around the world in recent years, that to me is, an, is a sign of great hope that even though authoritarian and illiberal governments and, you know, governments who are backsliding and from liberal democratic commitments and so on, um, that despite those, that I think there's a lot of energy and resilience still in the movement and a lot of adaptation taking place um, on the part of human rights um, actors and NGOs and advocates and so on. They're doing a lot of thinking and brainstorming and self-analysis and self-critique to think about the ways in which that they can harness, you know, the positive power of digitalization um, to, to shift away from the excessive focus of, you know, human rights in the past on just civil and political rights and ignoring socioeconomic inequality. There's been a big change in recent years um, in, in, in that respect. Um, and, you know, finding ways in the pandemic of building solidarity and, um, uh, of, of pushing back against um, the abuse of um, emergency powers, for example, by states. And so, you know, the last chapter is acknowledging that this is a really difficult era we're living through. There are major challenges, but at the same time, there's evidence, not just of, you know, civil society activism everywhere, but also of um, creative and thoughtful uh, reform of the human rights movement and adaptation um, to try to rise to uh, many of these challenges. So, you know, I do end up end on a note of, of hope, even while recognizing um, the extent and, and, you know, size of um, the challenges being, being faced. But, you know, my, my essential argument is that the, the human rights movement is a highly dynamic and pluralist one. And if we see it like that and um, widen our, our lens and our vision of what's, what's involved, I think it does represent our best hope at um, meeting the major challenges of our era. So I think I've spoken for long enough um, and this might be a good time to, to stop and to see whether there are any reactions or questions um, or thoughts that I could take on board, challenges to my arguments as well. <laughs>
Wonderful, thank you. While we give everyone a chance to type in their comments and their questions, I do quickly want to acknowledge Dr. Barbara Kirby, who's on this call with us. She's the director of the Pre-Law Advising Center here at UT Dallas, and they also co-sponsored this event. So I just wanted to recognize that, that she's on this call. Thank you, Cindy, that's nice. Yes, Unnecessary, but nice, thank yes, you. Okay, we already have a, a comment or question, both. Um, so it says that earlier you mentioned local independent actors like the press or local courts that can pressure governments to change in situations where civil activists and international pressure fail by themselves. Can you elaborate on that? How, why do these independent institutions succeed where other actors fail? Sure. Well, I mean, maybe a first thing to say is just that I wouldn't quite put it that the independent institutions and civil society actors fail. It's that the, the three sets are interdependent. They rely on each other for different things. Um, and so it's not so, so, you know, independent domestic institutions wouldn't be able to achieve much if they couldn't draw on the norms of authority and um, uh, the, the um, output of say the international institutions or by the domestic actors who bring the claims and identify the wrongs and articulate them and so on. But it's more that, so what I noticed, for example, was, let's say, uh, take, take the example, I was looking at child rights in Ireland. And so um, there are all, lots of very active children's rights NGOs, but Ireland was a traditionally Catholic, quite conservative society. And there was a strong emphasis on the authority of the family. So there, the idea of child rights wasn't really a very, uh, one that was, that was accepted very widely. And so many of these, um, uh, NGOs would go to the Committee on the Rights of the Child in Geneva and go to, um, you know, uh, the European Court of Human Rights and so on. And when those, you know, they, they then get a judgment or maybe um, a, a communication or concluding observations or whatever from uh, the treaty body. But then it's not that they'd fail, but that it's very easy for governments to just sit quiet and not to respond to those. So that's where bringing it to the media, for example, um, getting, uh, getting the issues aired domestically so that the international shaming part can have some effect because then if there's reporting on it and if there's uh, media attention given to it, it, it sort of begins to create greater pressure on the government or um, to go to a domestic court and to point out to, you know, to the domestic court that there is this, that that was very much the case in Argentina um, with disability rights activism, that they were trying to challenge uh, the lack of inclusive education for people with disabilities in Argentina. They got some really great um, output from the uh, Committee on um, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, but trying to get that accepted uh, domestically was very difficult. So they brought uh, domestic cases after doing the international uh, advocacy and they got uh, judges to you know, take seriously the arguments and the output of the international treaty bodies, or they also uh, they conducted some really savvy campaigns uh, to generate publicity and get media support as well. So that's the example of domestic courts and media kind of amplifying, adding to the pressure, you know, because domestic leverage is often better than international leverage because some governments find it very easy to ignore, you know, unless there's some sort of big money attached that they want to uh, be sure they get. But in the absence of that kind of incentive, it's very easy for governments to ignore international output. They deal with the embarrassment for a little while and then they let it drop. But if you have domestic actors that continue, that go to the ombudsperson, that go to, um, uh, to a court, uh, that go to a human rights commission, you know, that find some other voice or to like the opposition in, in parliament and so on, and get questions asked and so on. They, they keep the pressure on and they, they prevent the issue from going away. Um, and so that kind of clever use of bringing the international output back and levering, leveraging it then through um, different kinds of uh, independent domestic institutions. Um, so I hope that that clarifies a little bit. Definitely, definitely. I think Dr. Romer may have a question if he wants to, to go ahead and address you. Yeah, of course. Um, thank you, first of all. You, you, know, you complicated this narrative by bringing, populating the whole issue with so many more domestic and international players and kind of giving us a sense of how they're all intertwined. But I also do think that uh, while doing that, you ended up on, a, on the one side, as you said, on a bit of a hopeful note, uh, 
but you also were doing a good job at kind of managing expectation. And I think it was very interesting how you kind of shifted you know, verbally away from the initial critics that were about success and failure toward something you call more an ongoing iterative process. And I think that in lots of ways becomes, well, a bit more long, long-term long engagement yeah. rather than these kind of short-term. So that's you know what I would think is, is kind of interesting that in maybe we're mistakenly sometimes engaging this in the expectation of very quick and instantaneous successes. And then when they don't materialize, we think that the system doesn't work, yeah. that they're failure. So that's on the one. The other one, and, and you know, I find that also, you know, your hopeful message is almost in my mind, you know, actually on the, on the part of those that can make a difference by bringing so many more players to bear to the process, you're in lots of ways inviting everyone to have their part in it, right? That in so far, as you're saying, local voices are also part of a larger national, transnational, uh, process, they also have their role to play. And that is, I think, precisely what is sometimes so hard to see for our students right. that they are, you know, if you start with where you began with the turbulent times, the overbearing statistics of havoc here and havoc there, then that in many ways often leaves individuals with the sense of how can one possibly make a difference. Right. Yet, if I understand you correctly, you actually, right, in lots of ways bestowing more agency upon the local, you know, yeah. agents in, in this process than others would have. Would that be right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, let, let me start with your first your first point as well, which is I, I think that's absolutely right that, you know, you need, we, we need to take this longer term view of social change that any usually worthwhile social change takes longer. You know, I always remember people in, in the US talking about Brown against the Board of Education and just how, you know, that judgment was seen as such a great thing but then if you looked at it over the decades it was such a failure because integration didn't work and so on but if you take the long view about what what that process started and what unfolded since then and where we are now and you know you can't judge success or failure first in the short term but secondly um you know on the basis of you know an immediate output of that kind so it's not that i don't think it's not that I'm just saying, oh, all it is is a process and, and that's in itself success. There are outcomes, concrete outcomes, but the, you know, the, the kind of now we're there part of, you know, now we've actually achieved, you know, um, the full human rights outcome. That's a much longer term uh, strategy and um, horizon, I think. And, and so that would definitely be one, one thing I would say. And so when, when people say, you know, when the critics say, oh, what, what have human rights achieved? Uh, you know, we really need to you know, put the energy somewhere else. It's never clear to me what the somewhere else is. You know, like it's as though, well, is there some kind of political campaign we haven't thought about, you know, that, that's different from what, you know, human rights activists are, are arguing for. And it's, it's never clear to me what the, that alternative is. And yet, you know, we hear this a lot. Um, so yeah, and then, then this, to your second question, that's right. I, it, you know, the pluralist account is that this is not just for lawyers and by lawyers. In fact, lawyers can only achieve a, you know, a, a very small kind of um, slice of, or they only contribute to a small slice of the overall dynamic and, and picture. Um, and that you know, absolutely that. Um, it's the, the 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 greatest energy I, I see is is coming from um, those who are affected from domestic uh, actors of different kinds. And you know what I I always say, it's neither bottom up nor top down. That that's one of the arguments I've often made. You know, human rights doesn't come about just through domestic mobilization, and it doesn't come about just through international courts pronouncements or international treaty bodies outputs. Um, it comes about through the ways in which they engage, you know, with with one another. So, you know, I, I, it's like back to to um, the the question asked in the chat by by Daniel. You know, it's not that certain actors are better than others or stronger than others. It's that they rely on different roles and different um, parts being played uh, by different parts of of the system. Um, and there are probably many others that I haven't mentioned, you know, that could be brought into the picture too. Thank you. Thank you. We do have one more question that came to me in the chat directly, but I'll go ahead and read it. 
sure. said, should we criticize human rights and or its theory or the way in which human rights have been embedded mostly in legal state frameworks that from work that work from top to bottom and privilege national security over human security? You talked about this already, but I wonder what do you think about reclaiming political spaces to create local solidarity networks, a more horizontal approach such as a historical dialogue or mothers collectives, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, I completely, uh, I completely uh, support that latter suggestion that, um, and I think it goes to Niels Romer's suggestion as well, that the more actors that claim their own agency to, to invoke, to argue for, to claim, to push back against um, official interpretations of what rights do or don't permit, that's what brings rights to life. You know, the state is inevitably uh, a, a conservative agent, you know, and, and national security is always going to be um, uh, the primary or the the, uh, the primary concern, but also the, the the concern that's invoked, even if it's not actually the primary concern, you know, that security becomes a way of saying, no, we can't allow for this, or like in COVID, you know, everything um, has to come secondary to surveillance or whatever else it is. So yeah, absolutely that, um, state authorities um, you know and governments in particular are going to be the most resistant to the progressive implications of human rights um, and that the way to you know all these different kinds of uh, actors and institutions I'm describing are trying to bring pressure to bear on governments um, to precisely uh, sort of avoid the kind of um, human rights limiting approach or other prioritizing other kinds of um, interests like uh, a capacious notion of security in order to um, you know not to be responsive to human rights claims so absolutely I would um, I would uh, support your suggestion that the more we can bring in kind of uh, horizontal groups community groups collectives and so on to claim their rights to argue for them to advocate for them and i think they can get a lot of support from uh sometimes outside not always but they can get a lot of support from without the state there are these sort of networks and coalitions um, across borders as well which provide strategies and advice and you know support exp share experiences and so on with one another to show what worked in other jurisdictions um, and the more those are strengthened i think the more um uh, effective rights advocacy can be i think we had one other question from nancy caston right she was just sorry electronic hand pull up well let me can you hear me i'm sorry i'm not at my desk so can you hear me Yes, yeah. ma'am. Okay, great. I'm just wondering how you see things changing. I mean, I think I grew up thinking that the international human rights organizations, the UN, the International Court of Law, all those things were in the interest of U.S. interests. And now we're seeing um, the U.S. and some of their traditional allies being criticized by those institutions. How do you see that playing out for the overall strength and viability of those institutions in the future? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're certainly right that as the geopolitical order shifts and changes, that different institutions, their composition changes and different interests are represented and so on. Um, I think that's definitely true. I mean, the U.S. at different times and under different administrations has been more active in terms of engaging with rights institutions and less active at other times. Um, but it's certainly true for now, you know, if you, if you compare the Human Rights Council, for example, to some of the treaty bodies or courts and so on, um, it looks very different to um, 10 years ago. But um, I, I think that, so, you know, some of my argument is precisely that the changing nature of the international order it can be a source, it can seem like a source of instability and uh, risk, but it can also be a source of opportunity for, um, for those, you know, sort of arguing for different kinds of, um, of rights, uh, you know, claiming different types of rights and, and arguing for them. So, um, yeah, I mean, your, your question, I think, was a little more to are, are international institutions supporting states and um, 
you know, I guess it would depend, it depends on what the state's interests are. So there's certainly a much more uh, multipolar um, political order right now. The, the US is much less um, powerful than it was. I think that's, that's probably right. Um, but it still is a, a, you know, again, depending on the administration in question, um, you know, creates alliances, you know, with the moment Biden's trying to create this alliance of democracies and so on. So um, that, that's usually what you see is this kind of political reorientation to try to, to build new institutions or other institutions if some get captured and so on. So I, um, uh, I think that that's what we maybe we see happening at the moment. Yeah, it's certainly not, you know, the human rights system is no longer, it's, nobody would say it's the creature of the US, even if the US was very active in its um, foundation in its early years, but it has changed a lot. I think that's right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, um, we don't have any more questions in the chat and we have used up just about the full hour. So I want to be respectful of your time and everyone else's. Thank you very much for the talk and thank you to everyone who joined us. And I'm sure everyone will join me in either electronic applause or real applause, but thank you very much. Great, well, thank you for, I enjoyed the discussion. Thanks for inviting me. Yes, ma'am. Everyone have a good night. Good night, Bye. everyone. Bye, thank you again for joining us. Bye, thank you.